We're going to devote our energies to sports and gardening, all the cultural pursuits as far as they're concerned. In fact, we're going to put the goons to sleep. Meanwhile, we dig. Go again. So this is Burn Power coming to you from Tbilisi, Georgia, with uh, something a little different. Uh, I have finished my series, How We Got Here, and uh, a lot of people seem to have liked it. Some people have pointed out the musical sections. And I thought about that for a bit, and I thought what I should do is I've just got a special series of just the musical bits uh, that I've edited, and I think we're going to have three volumes of just the music sections from that. And that way, if you're more of a music hound or you don't want to sit through all of the other kinds of material, you can just watch these with the eyes of a musician. So... One thing I did think about briefly was maybe adding some material to it, but then I thought, no, that would make it too long. I did watch some of the parts again, and I thought to myself, you know, I really didn't really cover the music history that much in depth. And even though it, <laughs> these, these three parts are going to be long enough, Nevertheless, I thought at some point in the future, I really should do more of a straightforward uh, music history of some sort. Uh, 20th century music, rock and roll history, uh, maybe something even more extensive than that. But I'm going to let that sit and ferment. I want to uh, change gears and do some other stuff before that. So, without any further ado, here are the bits and pieces of music as they relate to the saga of how we got to where we are now. Hope you enjoy it. See you for the next edition of How We Got Here, the music edition. Uh, by the end of the 1950s, the, the, the large mass propaganda arm began to find its opposite in the counterculture, particularly starting with the beatniks and the folk revival movement, and eventually rock and roll would all become part of this countercultural variant. And eventually, uh, this would lead us to where we are today. Uh, all of these things uh, had been percolating down to the students, who were then saying, well, why do we do the things we do? And there wasn't any good answer, especially from a generation of parents who like to relax. Look at the cover of any easily listening record from the 1950s. It's all about relaxation. Uh, you see these people with martinis reclining on lounges or having pillows, little stuffed dogs, things like this. While they were relaxing, their students were joining folk protest movements or listening to this new kind of thing called rock and roll, whatever that was. Uh, it's just, oh, uh, they'll grow out of it. Uh. Within uh, a month of Kennedy's death, Bob Dylan who had already recorded the Times They Are a Changing album, which was in his folky protest mode still. Bob Dylan was invited to speak to um, 
a very left-wing gathering. Martin Scorsese documents this really well in his uh, documentary about Dylan, uh, uh, No Direction Home. And he, um, he basically just attacks these people who want to make him their kind of left-wing spokesman. For some reason, Dylan looked at, at Kennedy's death, and I think rightly said, politics is ridiculous. The what we do, the hatreds cost over. Why do I want to be associated as a political figure doing these, these songs that are just protest songs? So Dylan is really affected by that. What does Dylan do? Well, they eventually, in early 64, they release the times they are a changing. Everyone thinks it's the same Bob Dylan. That, you know, this is his reaction to things. It isn't. The album he really releases is Another Side of Bob Dylan. That's the first album after Kennedy's death. And in that, he starts doing his kind of hypnotic, uh, folky, uh, uh, lyrics, uh, surreal, beat inspired, totally Jack, uh, not Kerouac so much as Allen Ginsberg inspired. And Ginsberg had become a friend of his by this point. So what's interesting is that it changes Dylan's whole approach. Why is that so important? Because Dylan then, he starts first doing acoustic and then, inspired by the Beatles, he starts uh, doing electric uh, music. He, he buys his first electric guitar after seeing the Beatles perform in New York. And the Beatles are another interesting thing at this point. A lot of people forget when exactly the Beatles came. The Beatles came to America and performed on the Ed Sullivan Show in February of 1964. Now, February of 1964, essentially, it was near the beginning of February. February of 1964, okay, so the end of November 22nd, 1963 is when Kennedy is assassinated. So that's basically, you could say, November's done. So you have all of December and all of January and a couple of days on either side. So basically two months from the time that Kennedy was assassinated to the time the Beatles came. Now think about, if, if you want to put that in perspective, if you can remember what the nation was like two months after September 11th, it wasn't exactly like anybody had forgotten it. It wasn't exactly like we had gotten over it. Nope. Everybody was still thinking about it. Likewise, Kennedy's death was still fresh on everyone's mind. And if you were younger, I mean, I was seven years old. And I remember where I was when Kennedy was dead. Um, and that is, I remember I was in second grade. We heard this announcement. Uh, they turned on this really bad television reception at the school and we watched some sort of announcement and then people like broke into tears and then we all were sent home and then began the long weekend of the, uh, the, the funeral and of course Oswald's assassination and all of the rest of it. So here, you know, and you know, so the younger people, now I was too young to be, if I was a couple years older or in, at the end of high school or in university, I would have been affected totally differently the way people were affected. But imagine this. So this group of young, fresh faced guys comes. They're playing, they've just started playing their music on the radio in the exact same two month window. When, by the time the Beatles come, it is hysteria now. Yeah, that's total psychological damage from Kennedy. Yeah, the Beatles have their own thing. But would it have been quite so hysterical had we not had this massive tragedy right beforehand where essentially everyone's lost their father, especially if you're younger? No, I don't think so. I think it only with those, you have to put those two events together. But here's the point about Dylan. In the beginning, the Beatles are singing, She Loves You, Yeah, 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 I Want to Hold Your Hand. It's been a hard day's night. Yeah, they're great songs, but they're not deep. You know, lyrically, you're not going to feed on those uh, for that long. What happens? 
John Lennon and the Beatles meet Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan tells them, you guys aren't really singing about anything. Dylan's already singing Mr. Tambourine Man. Dylan's already on the way to composing things like like a Rolling Stone. And they're still singing, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not the, the Beatles said, yeah, we got to get in with it. And, and, and they weren't the only ones. Everyone started to look at Dylan. All the musicians looked at Dylan and said, well, we got to start changing what we're doing here. So that's the difference between the Beatles in 1964 and the Beatles in late 1966 and certainly Sgt. Pepper's. And if you hear songs like He's a Real Nowhere Man, John Lennon's song, you're listening to Bob Dylan. Uh, you know, Norwegian Wood, it's kind of Bob Dylan. Uh, but he wasn't, they weren't the only ones. But here's the point. They're the Beatles. They were the most influential band of the 1960s. And now they're changing their whole approach to music thanks to Bob Dylan. There were other influences as well. There was more of an influence of classical background, classical in quotes, background in music. And uh, the folkies were using like, you know, cellos and strings and such, uh, adding them to their, their music in the uh, mid-60s. But the Beatles, inspired by the competition with uh, the Beach Boys, uh, with their uh, album Pet Sounds, which had uh, fantastic production. And they, too, influenced by Mr. Dylan. Uh, everybody's changing their lyrics, but they're also changing their music. And it's the Beatles who get out in front of changing the music more than anyone. Well, more than anyone except for one person. Jimi Hendrix. Also, totally a Dylan fan. Dylan, in a sense, you could say Jimi Hendrix changes his music under the influence of Dylan. Basically, kind of something like this. Not only can I change my lyrics to be this wild, kaleidoscopic uh, melange of sound, I can change the music. Um, and there's a whole lot more to say about this moment in time because then you start getting people like the doors singing these very dark songs even the rolling stones who are doing more rhythm and blues when they started suddenly are doing what what are they doing they're doing uh essentially they start changing their songs to like painted black whoa where did those lyrics come from i see a red door and i want it painted black no colors anymore i want them to turn black it's like existentialism it's it's um it's beat poetry. It's uh, Dylan, again, the influence. Basically, every folky, every rock musician worth their salt is affected by Dylan's change of lyrics. That's one of the effects of Kennedy's death. So Kennedy dies. And it leaves this wound in the American psyche, which starts to change the thinking of people. It changes the thinking of people like Bob Dylan, who decides, yeah, I'm not doing this folky protest stuff anymore. That's all just politics. I'm going to do something poetic, something surreal, something unnameable. So he writes songs like Mr. Tambourine Man or Like a Rolling Stone. He eventually goes electric to do that, which creates another scandal in the folk protest world. Then... Um, he influences people like the Beatles, who take his ideas. Yes, they change their lyrics from, you know, I want to hold your hand to Strawberry Fields, whatever that means. <laughs> you know, which I'm sure there are people who will tell me exactly what that means. But what does that mean? Um, and then, uh, but that, the Beatles also change the music as well as the lyrics. So the Beatles and Dylan are like these two poles. But there was another one, and that was Jimi Hendrix, who also changes his lyrics and starts writing these extraordinarily sci-fi oriented, science fiction oriented uh, songs like Purple Haze or 1983, uh, Merman, I Will Be, you know, these, these strange songs. And then 
more importantly, he changes the music completely and adds these heavy uh, sounds that hadn't been heard since like box organ or or uh, the early 20th century century and people like uh, Holster Stravinsky. Uh, these heavy uh, uh, chord progressions and stuff, which eventually creates things like heavy metal. Then there were technological changes. Uh, we often think of well, the space race. And um, I think it was Walter Cronkite who said, if it wasn't for the Vietnam War, we might have remembered the 60s for the uh, space race. Yeah, there's something to that being said, but Kennedy's assassination changed too much for it to be that simple. Mm. But no, space was important as a hope, but I don't think it did touch that many lives in the same way that birth control pills did. And yes, birth control pills are a technology. Uh, so yes, it gave women uh, some kind of access to a sexual life apart from pregnancy. I say some kind because even today the verdict on what those little pills do to a body is still uh, being questioned in, in many quarters. And, uh, and plus, what happened with, uh, at the beginning of the 60s when these pills started to be used is they indeed a technological device did indeed change the se sexual ethics in America. Now, there was already the beginnings of a sexual revolution. We use that word, sexual revolution. And it really was a revolution. Uh, it's obvious in the 50s and uh, certainly going back to the Victorian age that there was a, an undue prudishness in society. And so maybe these things needed to be turned over. Uh, starting with uh, things like the Playboy magazine in the 1950s or the Kinsey Report, um, kind of treating uh, sex scientifically. And I say that in quotes because uh, Kinsey was about as scientific as, you know, uh, flat earthers are. I mean, really, uh, all of his data was skewed. And if you look that up, you'll see it was like, no, he went in to prove a point he already believed in which gave him the license to live any way he wanted. Oops. But nevertheless, that added to the, the bonfire. Uh, so did the pill, and the pill was like uh, an accelerant. It was like adding a, a gasoline to the fire. Uh, there was the, the Playboy aesthetic. There was a certain kind of cool that existed before the hippies, and it was typified by the Playboy lifestyle, but also by James Bond movies. Uh, it was kind of like, you know, uh, upper crust, uh, you wear your, you know, like a smart suit, uh, you know, the Rat Pack. Uh, you, you took advantage of sexuality. It was kind of a, something you laughed and tittered over, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't out in your face the way it was going to be by the end of the decade. But nevertheless, the sexual revolution was building steam and was going to, essentially the pipes were going to blow. Oh, there were so many other things, but let's get to the elephant in the room. And the elephant in the room is drugs. And um, the rock music was changing, but the rock music needed the accelerant of LSD in particular. The other drugs were there already in some fashion, uh, particularly uh, marijuana had been uh, there, had been in the jazz world, so had heroin. Um, he, I remember Jack Kerouac talking in one interview where he said, uh, you know, the, the, the drugs you shoot in, the, in your vein, those were the dangerous ones. Uh, whereas he wasn't, he didn't think uh, grass, marijuana, whatever you want to call it, weed, was that, was that big a deal. However, uh, one of the interesting things about grass was that it was something which was a euphoric and a hallucinogen. And Hallucinogens became the order of the day. Meanwhile, back in Stanford, uh, the LSD had been escaping the laboratory tests, and a good uh, supply of it went to a little commune up in the, uh, the hills near Santa Cruz, um, and that was Ken Kesey's compound where they pickled themselves in this stuff in amazingly high doses. 
But you know what happens is they had this experience which was wow, enlightening. Can you believe we thought the world was just this square, button-down place where it's really just like wild. You know, the doorways of perception was Aldous Huxley's phrase, and he was definitely a promoter of uh, LXD experiences as spiritual experiences. So was Timothy Leary. You know, you know, he really saw this as a way to find a spiritual experience. We tell young people today, drop out of school, because school's education today is the worst narcotic drug of all. Don't politic. Don't vote. These are old men's games. Impotent and senile old men that want to put you onto their uh, old chess games of war and power. Drop out. Uh, tune in with natural things. Take off your shoes. Uh, get back in tune with God's harmony. Surround yourself with beauty and sacred objects. You can't get caught in the conforming, rote, lockstep, which we call American society. Unfortunately, um, yeah, whatever happened to Arthur Lee or Sid Barrett or Skip Spence, all rock and roll musicians who got pickled and their brains got uh, were kind of distorted for the rest of their lives. The Kesey Group, uh, the people who rode the bus across America, painted it psychedelic colors, because that's what the drugs do to you, is they change your perceptions of colors and, and make things kind of like, funny thing, now we do that with uh, video. That is, you know, you go into your special effects and video and you can create all sorts of hallucinogenic effects. And after a while it gets boring. But these effects, what I've noticed is uh, recently talking to people who have used LSD, shall we say post Bill Hicks, uh, the, the late comedian who used to talk about uh, finding some sort of cosmic truth through uh, acid. He basically uh, set the template for a lot of people today saying something like, yeah, life's a trip and you need to, the only way to understand it is through this absurd thing, but it so opens you that what I've discovered is that people who take these trips it's just like normal life, human relationships, all the stuff of daily existence, you know, work, money, all this becomes pointless. And if it becomes pointless, um, you know, that is kind of where we live. And, and it does become pointless. So you're waiting for the big wow, but without, uh, with you know, how do you live in quotidian reality, meanwhile? That's the real question. How do you get through as, uh, I think it was Walker Percy said, it was like, was it Tuesday or Wednesday afternoon? It's just like, how do you face the horror of a Wednesday afternoon? It's the middle of the week. Nothing's happening. You're just doing your job. You're just another day. How do you get through that? And frankly, from what I've seen of people uh, using uh, drugs, none of it works to get you through that. Because it, it so takes you out, it so gives you this thing that you can never, it's like these uh, people are often permanently demented on this. Not demented, that's probably the wrong word. Affected is probably a better word. Although there's some dementia that goes on with very high doses. Um, but essentially, Kesey was also completely a beat, and he had uh, Neil Cassidy with him, who was Jack Kerouac's buddy, uh, with a On the Road fame, the book On the Road. Um, and they just got pickled, they had way too much sex because, you know, drugs break down the barriers of inhibitions. And suddenly they were acting like children. And some of the people who were playing at their parties were like Jerry Garcia of The Grateful Dead. And, and uh, people who would later drift into this area of San Francisco called the Haight-Ashbury. And what happened with, uh, with there was, there was an explosion of, what some people call an explosion of consciousness. A, a large part of the framework. I think that most of the people who are hippies now came to it through drugs. Yeah, but it's not a dope movement. We're not trying to We're not spread dope. dope. Yeah, well, we, I think, for personally, that uh, the more people turn on, the better world it's going to be. We were but, talking uh, before about a way of being. And, and, and one of the ways of, of achieving that being is through, through uh, drugs. 
expanding your uh, consciousness consciousness changing yourself but like uh, most of us have given up uh the psychedelic drugs anyway uh yeah right well we've learned something from them and now we're kind of playing around with that knowledge and it was an explosion of creativity certainly uh when i think of uh, the music that came out of there when i think of the uh the poster art was incredible it really affected me as a child uh, just to see all these colors and the images, which were often based on symbolist posters by someone like Alphonse Mucha. Or it was underground comics. Uh, think of R. Crumb. R. Crumb took uh, you know, quantities of LSD and came up with his trippiest figures. And, you know, these extended bodies and Mr. Natural and these just these crazy, crazy uh, uh, cartoon cute cartoon characters got insane essentially and he always thought it was a nightmare and he stopped using lsd relatively soon after that but he used the 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 experience to give him some sense of this the absurdity of life but the funny thing is is that um while it was a nightmare uh, other people had the same nightmare and loved his character. You know, keep on chucking the guy like way back. You know, it's just like this, this extended figure. You kind of get this with my hand here and the other hand way, way back here. And they're both in the same room, a couple of feet apart. But this is kind of what I'm talking about. This whole weird perception thing. Um, but uh, but yeah. So underground comics erupted from there, which would eventually. Uh, set a little, light a little fuse which would, by the 1980s, begin to really affect comic books much more than just the, uh, your standard, uh, uh, Superman and such. Uh, they start to meld various parts of these together. And there was much more. But the point was, so they were having these, these experiences, that's one way to describe it, the, the acid trips, uh, they were billed as experiments. And more and more people came to count the San Francisco. Particularly, uh, I asked a friend of mine once, what do you think, he was a hippie, and he was there as a, as a younger kid, uh, teenager, uh, well, older teenager in 1966, and he, he was there for the, for the most serious part of the, uh, of the 60s in San Francisco. And I said, well, 1966, what did you think? And he said, uh, amazing. Because that's when it felt like a community, and you kind of felt like you knew everyone involved with this weird experiment. And I said, uh, 1967, Summer of Love, and he just kind of rolled his eyes. Why? Because that's when the media discovered it, and that's when it all started to go wrong, really wrong. And by the end of that summer, Thousands and thousands of particularly teen and young 20-somethings were coming to, well, coming to the to hate Ashbury, coming for the love ends, coming for the, the free love and the grass. And they were also coming to be a part of, you know, some of them were going across the water. Here's what's really interesting is there were, many people think it was like, yeah, the 60s, yeah, there was hippies and there was love and then there was political action and people protesting. Well, those were two separate events. The Berkeley part was, uh, uh, that was where the protest works. And most of the protesters really didn't want anything to do with these love people over here. Because uh, the, 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 the hippies would say things like, I mean, the uh, protesters would say things like, yeah, we've got to stop the war. And the hippies would go like, you can't just take this, man. The war is going to go away. We're just going to will it to go away. And I was a kid and grew up in that area. I remember those people. Life on fire! And here's the problem. Uh, by 1967, so many people were taking drugs and listening to music and getting high and dancing, and, and although they were no longer dancing in any organized form. Uh, they just moved. Uh, and manners were breaking down and, and do whatever you wanted. Uh, and communes were being formed. Eastern religion was showing up, and uh, the occult was coming back, uh, the magic was coming back, everything, and, but it was like children, these 
older teens and uh, 20 somethings were becoming children, little children. Suffer not the children. Well, these children did suffer because the problem was they were all children and there were no grown ups. Well, I take it back, there were a couple. Bill Graham ran the Fillmore. Uh, with the Fillmore auditoriums, he was an adult, and uh, I think took LSD approximately once, and then had a had a trip. Said, "Wow!" and then said, "Man, if I do this too much, I'm gonna lose my shirt." But the truth is, for most people there, there were no adults. Everyone had become a child again, and then through that came cults sweeping people up. Through that, through Haight Ashbury, Charles Manson swept through, started his. Uh, sinister little commune, based on the same principles as hippie dump. Grass, LSD, plenty of sex, didn't matter who with or how many people. Yeah. And you know what started happening when I asked my friend, what did you think of 69, 1969? He said like, the apocalypse. And by 1969, San Francisco was deteriorating. The Rolling Stones had a free, uh, everyone remembers Woodstock. And they all said, ah, yeah, that was the beginning of the Woodstock Nation. That was like the end. That was like a, they didn't know it at the time, but they were celebrating the end of the street. Um, I mean, people will still say, yeah, but I really believe, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> it it kind of died. And, um, but, but by the end of the year, the Rolling Stones held this festival, the Altamont Rock Festival, where people died and one guy got murdered right in front of the stage. And uh, the funny thing is, I mean, in 69, that's, well, that's when the Manson killings were. That's when, uh, what is it, uh, oh, Anton LaVey. Anton LaVey published the Satanic Bible. That was a nice milestone. It was essentially a Bible for atheists who wanted to be really selfish and using Satan as a metaphor. But still, uh, let's see, 1969, the Vietnam War just kept droning on. Oh, yeah, Nixon was in office. Um... 1969, yeah, 1970, 71, people started dying. People died at other rock festivals as well. I remember some guy I knew uh, in 1971 uh, told me he was up at a rock festival in Oregon and some body floated by on the river near the rock festival. Oh, well, that's when, like I was saying, people started dying. So, Jimi Hendrix died. Janis Joplin died. Jim Morrison died. And, you know, a little bit before that, Brian Jones, who used to be the leader of the Rolling Stones, he died. And it was essentially all related to drugs. So, and, and there were more things. The counterculture in general started to feel like wobbly. Um, uh, there was uh, bombings that started to feel like uh, the, done by the people protesting, um, the weathermen. Uh, and oh, there was a, uh, in Greenwich Village, there was an apartment that blew up when they were mixing chemicals. There was more radical protests. Uh, it seemed like every group was becoming more extreme. So kind of went from the Black Panthers to the Symbionese Liberation Army. How's that for a name? C. Patty Hearst. When Kurt Cobain died, I mean, that was on the cover of magazines, the end of, you know, the, a great uh, performer. It was really the end of an epoch, too. But um, where do you think Jimi Hendrix's name was when he died? There was a little article in Time Magazine, Newsweek. Yeah, rock guitarist Jimi Hendrix died. Rolling Stone did more of a tribute. Uh, you know, the, the Rolling Stone, again, was the only place. At that time, they were pretty cool. And uh, don't worry, they're not cool at all and haven't been cool for like 30 years or more. But uh, at that time, uh, they did a, I, I, I did an article about uh, the Altamont Rock Festival and pointing out like, oh my God, what have we done? And there was in fact a radio broadcast the day after the Altamont uh, Rock Festival saying, uh, you know, we, the flower children, are losing it. And that was exactly true. Hello. Um, we have a group of people here in the studio, and we're going to talk about what happened yesterday at the Free Rolling Stones concert. Uh, at Altamonte, there was a miniature society set up of 300,000 and upwards people. 
It was supposedly a society of uh, the new generation, the love generation, uh, the brave new world, the children of the future. And as far as uh, I can say, I don't want to live in a society like the one I saw yesterday. And we're going to discuss um, some of the things that we saw, and then we're going to open up the phone lines and have people call and give whatever comments they have, whatever things they saw, how they felt about the concert yesterday. I mean, the lack of consideration, the, the total disregard for other people and uh, the lack of, of spirit, like, you know, we're one community and we got to pull this thing off, and if there's a crisis, you know, we got to work together and... And that whole feeling was missing. There were there were times, you know, when, during the chaos that uh, was around me. I was in back of the stage. Uh, there was a medical center and a place for bum trips, and and people were coming through there, using it as a, a a traffic area. And there were a lot of people lying on the ground, you know, and people trying to minister to them and and talk to them. People on bad trips, and other people were just walking through the area with with obviously no regard for what was going on there. And when we tried to set up barriers and, and keep the flow of people uh, out of that area, everybody, nobody paid any attention. They just kept shoving their way through, you know, well, we want to get to the front of the stage and giving excuses about, you know, well, I left my party back at the front. And uh, I don't know, it was, it was very, very uh, strange. I, I didn't feel any sense of community with a lot of the people there. I felt like, uh, I mean, these weren't my people. <laughs> Should we talk For about flower it? children, we were almost like infants. <laughs> uh, one of the things that that may come from, and one of the things that we've been talking about, is drugs and the effect of drugs on that gathering of people, and whether you can put that many people together, let them all get stoned behind different kinds of things, uh, on purpose and accidentally, and come off with uh, anything like an ideal human ingathering, or whether it's just going to be... Uh, a very unpleasant experience, I guess. Yeah, right. I think. Yeah, I think the drugs is another. Uh, I mean, uh, the total irresponsibility as concerns drugs. The fact that people were giving drugs in wine and in, uh, you know, in bottles without telling people right. that there was so there was drugs. Yeah. I, I right. got to jump in here because um, I was at Woodstock, and all of the things you're saying went wrong about the breakdowns in, in lines and about the wine and the booze and, and the acid and the indiscriminate use of drugs and all of that, and even the bad drugs, all those things that, that happened here, they happened at Woodstock, too. But it was a different thing. I can't explain the difference in feeling. Uh, coming in to this one, I, we felt, I felt the same way as I did at Woodstock. Coming into Woodstock, I was freaked. I, it was big. I was afraid. But then it got together. Well, what, made, what, was, together. what was the difference? That's what I'm trying to get to. And coming in to this concert last night, I had that same good feeling that I had at Woodstock when it all got together. But this one never came together. It never got together to the point of, uh, of a universal kind of uh, thing that sparked inside of everybody and said, hey, you know, let's all get behind the spirit of this festival. And... The spirit of Woodstock was a getting together in the way we're talking about it. The spirit of uh, Altamonte, I guess we're going to have to learn to pronounce it because it's going to be it's around Altamonte a while. Uh, Altamonte <laughs> is, it was, was, you know, the hell with you, brother. You know? It I was, want to see the stone. The spirit of Altamonte <laughs> was, you know, I don't give a damn whether you've got a ride home or not, you know? I don't give a damn whether you're on a bum trip or not. I'm on my trip. You're on yours. As time went on, the uh, rock journalists just absolutely refused to say anything like that. Why? They liked the music. And the music kept going. In fact, the music became big business. That's why it kept going. And uh, eventually, well, it's funny. The media really hyped up San Francisco in the summer of love. They really hyped up, um, like, Woodstock. And they never gave an obituary when the whole thing started to go sour and die. So, if you came to San Francisco in 1971, which people were doing, you weren't in the same place. This was not the free love world. I mean, yeah, people were having sex, and yeah, there's still plenty of drugs around, uh, but... You know, nobody was taking LSD for for a spiritual experience at that point, hardly. Everyone was essentially just getting high, dude. 
you know. And um, the 70s was a completely different kettle of fish. But I find it interesting as a point of collusion that we go back today and we remember the 60s, all the great things of the 60s. When in fact the 60s was a catastrophe. It was the psychic damage of World War II and Kennedy's death, among other things. Uh, there's a whole lot more to say. We could talk about, you know, uh, the protests in the Czech Republic, the Czech Spring. We could talk about uh, what happened in France in 1968. No, the 60s weren't a good time. The 60s, however, were an earthquake that changed everything. And the world we're living in today is impossible to imagine without the 60s. Sin and salvation was all part of the equation. It's the same with the blues or country music. You can hear songs, country songs that are about, uh, you know, someone having a loving family and home and they're afraid of losing these things. Uh, they believe in God, like Elvis Presley talked about. And then on the other side of the coin, you have uh, country songs and blues where suddenly it's like, I don't know, I've lost my soul. I'm, you know, I'm a rambling man. Uh, you know, uh, I'm a hoochie-coochie man. But it's all still in the context of this larger society. It's still in the context of sin and salvation. After World War II, these things became more superficial. And by the time of the mid-1960s, they were very superficial indeed. Uh, I would say nominal Christianity was the order of the day. And so... When the hippies came along and the other people, uh, the new left and such, and essentially blew up the, uh, the moral foundations within their own lives and the manners, it seemed very seductive. The images of dancing people in the park and, and people acting like children and saying like love and this indiscriminate use of the word love became essentially, it was like a, a honey. It was a sweet. It seemed like a, a good, sweet, seductive thing. And people began to, you know, people didn't stop doing drugs because the hippies got burned out. People didn't start uh, stop having sex because the hippies had problems with free love. Oh, no. Everything changed. Drugs continued, like I said, to be a problem. Sexuality continued to be a massive problem when it wasn't the same kind of problem prior to the 1960s. And one could say, well, yeah, that's because they were all doing it wrong and they were hypocrites and such. Well, now, often the word hypocrisy has changed. So what used to be hypocrisy is a person who said, I live by these standards and acted differently. But now it's more like this. Oh, you say there are moral standards. That's why you're a hypocrite. Because you try to live by moral standards. That's why you're a hypocrite. That's been the more recent definition of hypocrisy. And people occasionally will hearken back to the older definition when they really want to make a point. But the more recent definition is you say you have standards. Look at how you're living. You are a hypocrite. There are no standards. So you should live for yourself. And that's where we are today. People believe in living for themselves, which is sad. <laughs> Just sad beyond words, living for yourself. I can't find a more minuscule reason to live. And that's the point about losing meaning. Meaning went from, you know, there is a God in the world who created human beings uh, and people in different cultures had different versions of, of their religious ideas. There was always a reason why we were here in some way. To suddenly there being no reason, or whatever reasons we had were kind of flimsy. They were all hypocritical in the new sense of the word. And so people essentially gave up. And what you find in the 1960s is lots of philosophical questions were being asked in the 1960s. But in the 1970s, it was looking out for number one. Me. And that's why Tom Wolfe called it the me decade. The me generation. That's what the 70s was all about. It became about me. 
And uh, one could argue it's been about me ever since. I'm the only, you know, I'm the only person who matter. And I need to care about that. Now, things have changed a bit. And I would say that the current uh, farther left philosophies have started to emphasize the collective again. But in very strange terms of what group identity you have. And yet, at the same time, they're still completely infected with me. Everyone says, I define myself. Oh, really? Do you define yourself? You think you do. It isn't until you understand you don't that you can actually get some sort of true image of what yourself is. When you realize how affected by other people and the media you are, then you can start to get some glimpse of who you might be. So, meaning suffers. You can see this. The early 70s was an extraordinarily dark time. So, you know, there were some people, like I said, still going to San Francisco. And I remember seeing these people come. But increasingly, uh, it became a lost dream. If you were in 1972 in, say, Marin County, just north of San Francisco, you might go to uh, a freeway on-ramp and see maybe 20 or 30 people hitchhiking up north or down south. I remember watching one guy as a kid. He was sitting there. Cars were going by, and he was just like, and 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 he had a, he was kind of scruffy looking, uh, more scruffy than me. Uh, he was kind of scruffy looking, had a dark hair, kind of stringy hair, and a, and a dark beard. He was wearing just a white t-shirt. Uh, and, you know, it looked kind of grungy. And every time the person would pass, he would just like go, you know, and just blow, you know, just completely rail on them, just completely trash them. Finally, someone stops to pick this guy up. I know because I was hitchhiking at the same place as like a 16-year-old or a 17-year-old. Finally, someone stops to pick this guy up. And as when they stop and open the doors, he goes like, it's about time. Well, that kind of gives you a small a little story which can serve as a metonym for the larger period. The good vibes were off. People weren't picking people up anymore. Um, it was getting tougher and tougher. Uh, the hitchhikers would disappear from the on-ramps by about 73 or so. Um, why? Well, there were a lot of reasons. One was the vibes were, were different by 73. Another is some people were getting picked up hitchhiking and uh, being left on the side of the road dead by... That's when, uh, in, in the period from, say, 69 to 73 or so... Wow, what, there were like five maybe active serial killers in the San Francisco Bay Area picking people up, mostly women, and killing them? Hmm. Yeah, it just didn't seem so safe anymore. If you listen to the music at the times, there was some very dark music. Particularly, it's interesting because of this, the, like I said, certain aspects of the civil rights movement just felt like they failed. And there were songs like Smiling Faces. Sometimes they don't tell the truth. Or uh, Sly and the Family Stone, uh, his album, Thank You for Talking to Me, Africa. Very dark, slow, brooding funk song. And there were a bunch of them at that time. Uh, Grail Marcus uh, kind of gets into this period in his book, Mystery Train. He's got an essay in there where he talks about the change uh, he's talking about Sly and the Family Stone in the essay, but it's the change in the environment. It went from these songs like Respect, which, you know, the great Aretha Franklin song written by Otis Redding, to the, the you know, the, the title track of There's a Riot Going On uh, from the Sly and the Family Stone album. The timing on that is zero colon zero zero. In other words, there's no riot going on. There's no change going on. There's nothing going on. And that was... His uncharacteristically down beat. I mean, Sly and the Family Stone was known for being like one of the most up organizations ever as far as music goes. If you watch his performance at Woodstock, he's like the god of, of energy. And he's, you know, I want to take you higher and getting everyone to raise their hands. It's just, a, it's breathtaking, really. But by the early 70s, there was a sense it's failed. Or as Pete Townsend once called the 70s, the uh, fall of the Roman Empire. There was a sense of purpose to what was going on in the 1960s. We're changing something. We're asking questions. There were so many songs 
about searching in the late 1960s. But that dried up by the early 1970s. <laughs> Briefly, there was a moment when there was a new kind of music that seemed like it might develop in interesting ways. We saw Larry Norman, uh, and he was very interesting because he didn't fit the mold of so many of these new Christian singers. He would often put out an album that seemed on the surface to be secular, and yet had a lot of other things going on in it. He wasn't afraid to make statements about whatever he thought about, not just the same Jesus loves you message everywhere. There was also the Maranatha Ministries from Calvary Chapel, and they started putting out uh, uh, albums. I remember the first one we, we kind of ate up. In fact, we started singing some of those songs. Um, and that, however, was a problem, that those songs were going to start drifting. We actually invented all sorts of songs. If you hear a couple of songs on this uh if you hear a couple of songs on this uh, video, those songs actually come from ministries north of San Francisco that had not been influenced by the Los Angeles scene yet. But occasionally, like a group like the second chapter of Acts would come up with a very distinctive sound. They had these very unearthly harmonies. They put more of an emphasis on spiritual music. However, uh, this Christian music was going to be revealed to be one of the great defects of the Jesus movement. The, for one thing, the stuff coming out of Southern California, which was the bulk of it, a lot of it started to have a second-rate California sound. You know, if you think of Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, uh, The Eagles, Joni Mitchell, all, this, all the things germinating around that time. This was all like a degree lower, kind of imitating that style. Um, it wasn't terrible. Some of it was actually quite, um, quite good, but... Uh, it just didn't have a, a spark of authenticity. Um, I think north of San Francisco, where uh, we weren't so influenced by that stuff, we actually had more interesting music. We just didn't record ever. Um, we actually had the, one of the last remaining folk cultures in America. Uh, but there was an increasing commercialization. Eventually, the Maranatha people started putting out Albums of praise songs. Don't get me started talking about the curse of praise songs in the Christian churches. But even worse, they had praise songs turned into strings, which essentially is just easy listening music by any other name. And you've fallen all the way into the commercial gutter at this point. You're just making product. And eventually this all leads to CCM, com uh, Contemporary Christian Music. I just call it Commercial Christian Music. And there were charts, and uh, essentially it becomes just a musical propaganda arm of the evangelical churches. And even the second chapter of Acts ends up doing like these albums of hymns, which are just, I mean, the production is just so overblown and overdone. And it's like they've lost all the uh, the... The, the musical and spiritual depth they had, it becomes this glaze. And, and that, unfortunately, is the history of so much of that music, which then enters the churches as these terrifying praise songs, which just repeat 
over and over and over on the basis of the fact that people can't remember things anymore. And just like they need sound bites in their news, they need short verses that they can sing over and over and over in order to worship God. And so this, unfortunately, is the real effect of the Jesus movement. mention should be made of glam and glitter rock, particularly David Bowie, who, uh, it's interesting, uh, at his death a few years ago, people looked at him as a hero because he was seen as a forerunner. His music and the music of glam was the first openly androgynous music scene that there really was. And it was also uh, it was very gay in many respects, but it also had aspects of bisexuality to it. Very complex. But uh, his song Rebel Rebel, I think, summarizes a certain attitude. And I've certainly heard that played at gay pride parades with a great deal of gusto. <laughs> talking about the 70s last week and the changes. It's interesting. The music went from searching to just being big business music. Uh, Bill Graham called the kind of concerts that people started to perform in the cement factories, these huge arenas where you would go sometimes to see a massive group like Led Zeppelin, the Rolling Stones, the Who, or you'd go to an all-day festival where lots of uh, other uh, groups uh, trying to buy their way, but when you go to these big, huge concerts, I never went to one because, well, for reasons I'll eventually explain in another episode, but I was outside of that loop uh, at the time, and kind of gladly so, I, although it would have been interesting to go to one of these huge events. I, I did go to concerts uh, of a similar nature later in the 80s, but I didn't do that in the 1970s, and I'm glad I didn't go to see some huge arena to see Peter Frampton play... Uh, his, his songs with his vocorder, you know, a uh, little device in his mouth. That would have been strange. Um, but, uh, so I saw the movie Rocket Man, the uh, uh, kind of a biopic, really a musical, but a pretty honest musical about Elton John's life. Now, I would say pretty honest because at the end, it definitely goes for the, and everything worked out, uh, you know, uh, and Elton John's life w worked out happily ever after because he became more honest and didn't have any more problems, which I can hardly believe, uh, given the nature of the story. But the story is very much a 70s story. A lot of people might look at that and say, wow, those rock musicians had such crazy lives. I mean, you see something similar in the recent Bohemian Rhapsody, uh, Freddie Mercury story. Although I would say that was a little less honest in many ways than the Elton John story. The Elton John story, the only thing I really criticize is the, um, is, is the end where it just is a little too triumphant. Uh, I mean, I, I, it would have been nice if they snipped it off before he got to some sort of like, you know, and everything worked out sort of ending. Um, but, the rest of the film was brutally honest about uh, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Uh, and essentially, it doesn't paint a really good picture. What a lot of people don't realize is 
that wasn't just the lives of uh, the rich and famous rock stars. That was the 70s. The 70s was a, an era of extreme excess because, like I said, the moorings had been pulled out and, in a sense, the boat was floating away from the shore and the boat was what we were all eventually going to be on. Uh, there were still some people left on the other side of the crack, you might say, of the ice shelf. But eventually those people would become more and more, well, they're not insignificant because they're human beings, but irrelevant to the discussion at hand, uh, and without any power to change anything. So, but yeah, so Rocket Man was interesting because it really shows the, the heart of darkness of the 1970s in a very flamboyant musical way. I thought the musical numbers were great, um, and I'm not going to turn this into a review of the movie, but, I, uh, but it was interesting focusing on someone like Elton John, I mean, it's interesting now the fact that uh, Queen and Elton John are considered the bellwethers of the 1970s. They weren't at the time. It was Led Zeppelin, The Who, and The Rolling Stones. It was uh, California sound that is typified by the Eagles or even Joni Mitchell during her Californian phase. It was, uh, you know, uh, well, funk music. Those were all what people really paid attention to. Elton John was like John Denver, someone in the background who was successful uh, but you didn't pay him that much attention. Um, you know, uh, Queen a, a bit more so. But it was like, yes, these people got a lot of press. But were they the mega stars we see them as today? Were they the standard bearers of the 1970s that we see them as today? Not really. Not really. And um, I mean, if you were to do any... Uh, I remember listening to KFRC in the 1970s, just driving around. And at one point they did a top uh, 500 of all time kind of thing. They had done one of these in the 1960s. And the number one song was Can't Get No Satisfaction by the Stones. But now the Stones have been relegated further down the chart. And what was number one was Stairway to Heaven by Led Zeppelin. Stairway to Heaven by Led Zeppelin is the 1970s. That's like quintessential 1970s. And someone like uh, Queen, whom the critics hated at the time, uh, they, they called them quasi-fascist for songs like, you know, we will, we will rock you. And in fact, there's something quasi-fascist about those large concerts anyway. And because essentially the power of the microphone and particularly the power of the amplification systems really put all of the people in that environment under the subservience of the people who held the power. Uh, Pete Townsend once said, there's something about plugging in a guitar, turning it to 10 in a stadium, and hitting a power chord. It's just an experience you don't forget. You realize how much power those rock musicians had at the time. And, and keep in mind, there wasn't any MTV with uh, constant video rotation. So if you wanted to see one of those performers, you had to go to one of those concerts. And yet the problems of the manners and the meanings and the morals of the times, these were pretty substantial problems. And they weren't going away. But there was a sense towards the middle of the... Uh, 1970s, that these large, bloated bands, I think Emerson, Lake, and Palmer traveled across the United States with not one, but two loaded semi-trucks full of their equipment on a tour. Yeah, how are you going to get to be a rock musician under those circumstances, where you have to prove that you can put on this wild show for people? South Bronx, which was doing so badly, having hemorrhaged all of the people who kind of held the communities together, who had a chance to leave, so they left. Oh, good for them. Meanwhile, the poorest of the poor were left behind. I had a friend. Uh, now, it, the South Bronx had turned into a large black ghetto, but not entirely large. I had a friend who lived in the South Bronx. He was white, kind of a remnant of the older Jewish culture that had been there. And when he was growing up there, he said uh, the back half of his building wasn't there. So he lived in a building that half of it was gone. And uh, 
And that was common. I remember a friend of mine who also was uh, Jewish and grew up in the South Bronx uh, drove me through a, kind of a tour of the South Bronx neighborhoods with a friend and just gave us this tour. And we had to be very careful if we stopped too long with the car he had uh, borrowed at an intersection because people would start rushing up to us. <laughs> and fortunately, my friend was from the South Bronx, so he was... Um, the kind of guy who really could not be intimidated, <laughs> you know. But, uh, um, yeah, it was a, a wasteland in the 1970s. And, and landlords were burning buildings down to get the, uh, collect on the um, insurance money. So it was in this urban wasteland that rap music was born. It was started with... Uh, uh, you know, some equipment stolen from, uh, off, uh, as we say in New York, it fell off a truck. Uh, um, you know, some equipment, shall we say, fell off a truck and then uh, was used for house parties and street parties. And it was in this environment where we had a couple extra turntables and uh, amplifiers that, uh, you know, the idea of taking the B-sides, uh, the instrumental B-sides of certain funk uh, and soul records and whatnot uh, became an important thing. And it was actually started by uh, people, there were people uh, who had uh, Jamaican connections because they were doing this kind of thing in Jamaica. It's the way that poor people can make music out of other people's music. So uh, in Jamaican, it's, it was called uh, toasting and, you know, where you uh, rap over lyrics and, and it became rap music by the end of the in 1979 you had the first huge rap hit which was the sugar hills sugar hill gang's uh uh rapper's delight and then you had uh other you know curtis blows uh, the breaks uh you, eventually by the early 1980s you had uh grandmaster flash and the furious fives the message which is the first song that's like you know Maybe I'll play. Let me give you just a quick sample of the lyrics from uh, the message, and you'll get an idea of how dark it was. And we're gonna tell y'all about New York City. We love it over there, but this is what it's like. We're gonna tell y'all about this. We got broken glass everywhere. People pissing on the stage. You know they just don't care. I can't take the smell. Can't take the noise. Got no money to move out. I guess I got no choice. Rats in the front room. Roaches in the back. Junkies in the alley with the baseball bat. I tried to get away, but I couldn't get far. Cause a man with a torch will repossess my car. Don't push me because I'm close to the edge. And I'm trying not to lose my head. <laughs> it's like a and and when I arrived in New York City in 19, the end of 1980, and New York was still in that 70s zone and would remain so for a while, uh, certainly till the middle of the 80s, uh, this kind of like fallout zone. But um, what was interesting about rap music, it was, it was a hip-hop culture. So there were different aspects. There was graffiti and tagging, which involved uh, essentially people... This is where the whole thing of ta putting your name as a tag came on. Uh, the, uh, interestingly enough, uh, a lot of the script for tagging was developed by a guy ha having nothing to do with that culture named Von Baudet, who, uh, whose work was appeared in some alternative comic magazines that somehow made their way into South Bronx culture. And they loved the kind of balloony script that Von Baudet had created. And so that, that became the central, uh, emphasis of, of, uh, the, the graffiti culture. I mean, there were other people who kind of la leached on it. I would say like, uh, Keith Haring. I never considered that real, the real thing. Um, and that was the kind of thing that became popular in the art world. But today, I mean, people, it's funny how the, this, this culture has gone all over the world. And it still has this sense of, we don't care about your culture. I just want to see my name on, on a train going by. I just want to see my name on a wall. Which to me is not the best thing. Although there are buildings, I think, that scream to be defaced. But the problem is, uh, as I've seen it, even here in Tbilisi, Georgia, recently there was a kid who put his 
tag, he, I shall not even mention his name because he deserves no attention whatsoever, on a really beautiful building down here. Well, that's a disgrace. If you're going to put a tag on something, make it some ugly modern building, please. <laughs> some brutalist piece of architecture. Something we don't want to look at anymore. Uh, change it. Yeah, that's my advice to you. Graffiti artists. Uh, and, you know, legitimacy, legality, that's up to you to deal with. But, um, the other aspects were, of course, rapping, which was an art form all itself. And I thought it was interesting. Not the first time that people had been rapping. Uh, there had been, you know, Convoy, the country song from the 1970s, trucker country song. That was rap music in a sense, country rap. Uh, but it, you know, the rhythms were not at all the same. Uh, you, and there were a lot of country songs that were talk, talking country songs where you talk over things. There was also in the, uh, black American community, there were things like, well, I've got this comedy record from the 1970s. They'd call these, uh, party records, uh, kind of off color comedy by Jimmy Lynch where he's talking about, uh, shall we say, a man and a gorilla in a certain way. And what happens is he's talking with the rhythm of the music. So the music is... This slow funk thing. And he's talking his comedy routine over it. Now, this is well before rap music. But you can go back to uh, Chain Gang. Uh, music in the 1930s and certainly before that, but we, our first recordings are from the late 30s. And you hear people talking over the rhythm, you know, talk, chant, sing. Uh, so, you know, the idea of rapping or talking over music is not new. What was new was taking these old records. So you then have another art of DJing or turntablist who who then mixes these things, and uh, they used to call it the Wheels of Steel. There's a great Grandmaster Flash uh, piece called Grandmaster Flash on the Wheels of Steel. You should go look for that and listen to that. That's a really good idea. Then there was also uh, popping and locking, breakdancing. And breakdancing itself is very interesting because as a form, it's one of the first forms to kind of say we're beyond... Uh, we are beyond that old thing of dancing together. It's, it's almost like dancing for the new era. And the new era now is a group of people having a contest with each other. It's like, say, some Russian dancing in a way, uh, where people would say, now it's your turn. Uh, in Georgia, it's like that as well. And so in a sense, it's kind of like my sense is it's not necessarily a re return to folk culture as it's a new culture, a new recombinant culture, where you're recombining things. It no longer... Uh, originally, this was about the South Bronx, but eventually rap music and break dancing and the rest of it would spread throughout the world. And that's a fascinating thing all by itself. And of course, among the rappers and b-boys and b-girls and whatnot, there was a great respect for horror films. <laughs> I remember talking to a guy back in New York City, worked at a bank, smooth black guy, used to come into this record store I worked at. And we had a great talk. We were both Christians and such. As soon as I mentioned Ch Texas Chainsaw Massacre, he was like totally on that and had no problem with it. He understood it. Uh, you know, that this to say there was something <clears throat> that connected. So I feel like some kind of aesthetics, and you can see this in later rock music, particularly with groups like uh, Cypress Hill, pay a lot of tribute to kind of a horror aesthetic, particularly in their Temple of Boom album, which really feels like a horror movie soundtrack. But that's getting ahead of ourselves. Rap music, though. It's the music of a decayed world. And it's the music of, of people who have no other means of making music, who don't play instruments because instruments cost money and because they've long since passed out of a culture that has instruments. They live in poverty, which is one reason I think that rap music is translated around the world to so many people because they see that um, there's something in it that they can do and it doesn't require a lot of money to do that. And so you can do that in India or China or Japan. You can do it in uh, uh New, New Zealand among the Maoris, or you can do it in uh, South America, or you can do it in uh, France, or you can do it in Germany, or you can do it uh, anywhere. 
And so it's a style that has really trans gone around the world to become, rather than a new geographic folk style, it's become a new tribal style. Let's discuss punk rock, shall we? We could blow this place apart if we wanted to. The speed, the intensity. Sticking your finger in a socket, you know? Punk is whatever you want to make it. Punk rock is definitely about breaking shit. I want to break chairs, I want to smash furniture. I want to shake the juice and burn! I love your juice! The attitude was generated by the music. We're born punks and we'll die punk. If you're miserable enough to watch and listen to this report on punk, f you. Because I'm a punk rocker. It was angry, chaotic, and rebellious. Stripped down, offensive, and sometimes violent. It was an anti-movement. It's kind of an instinctual reaction to the things that oppress you. <laughs> A rock revolution begun the old-fashioned way. With blood, spit, guts, and loud, fast songs on guitars some could barely play. How much did you guys rehearse for this show? Nothing at all. We haven't played in a month. Punk started as an attack on the soft and sensitive hippie culture. All those hippies. Only people you could rely on were your other punk friends and everyone else could just like. And it turned into an all-out audio assault on overproduced corporate rock of the 70s. First of all, was punk rock even important? I say that because at the time, there were people I met who didn't think it was important at all. But they didn't really know what it was, for one thing. And there were a lot of misconceptions. By this time, well, the, uh, the media had already kind of smeared the word hippie around, so no one knew what that meant anymore. Um, and punks would follow suit as something that's just these angry kids in England kind of thing. So, yeah, I remember talking, I, I, in 1980, I did a lecture. It was one of my first lectures. And the subject was the relationship between horror films, punk rock, and fashion. Yeah, I did that in 1980. Wow, a long time ago. <laughs> and I'm surprised I put all those things together uh, way back then. Yeah, I did a lecture at Sonoma State University in Santa Rosa. Well, it was really Katati, California. And I was invited. The, the lecture went well. I used slides and music. Uh, um, it, it was re received quite well. And there were hardly anybody influenced by punk rock at all at that time in that particular college. There was like one girl who kind of dressed what I call a little new wavy. But really, the ideas really hadn't spread too far. This was about, I don't know, 40 miles north of San Francisco, 30 or 40 miles and, but I was invited over to, like, a get-together with the professors, and so they were talking, and I, and I ended up talking, there was a black guy who was uh, one of the teachers there, and I started talking with him, and then he just said, now, why are you talking about punk rock, he said to me. He says, like, this has no real significance, it's just fashion, you know, it'll come and it'll go. And... It was interesting. I mean, he was really kind of offended that I would spend any time thinking about it. But I felt it was something much more important than that. I mean, I even uh, later, uh, someone, a friend of mine, went and saw Oz Guinness somewhere and uh, told him I'd been working on these things. And I love listening to Oz Guinness speak. I, I read his uh, book, Dust of Death, when I was at Labrie in 1979. Actually, I think I read it before I got there. And, um, uh, and, and I've had a great deal of respect for him ever since then. But my friend went and told him I had been working on these ideas about punk rock. And Oz Guinness was just kind of like the same thing. It's just a fashion. It's not that big a deal. And, uh, and I was like, you know, have I, you know, you know, what am I seeing in this? Well, here's what I was seeing. 
I questioned myself a little bit, but I knew I'd, I'd tripped onto something. And one of the things was that it was connected to that chainsaw. It was a desire to loose oneself of that artificial smile of hippiedom, which is now the artificial smile of geekdom um, and, and of culture in general. Wherever you go to commercial culture is all the artificial smile now. Let me tell you what, how I first heard about punk rock. It was, I believe, in 1976, around the time of the Jubilee, well, maybe that was 1977, uh, the Queen's Jubilee celebration, and the song God Save the Queen by the Sex Pistols had been creating a bit of a, a furor over in England because they actually had the nerve to equate Queen Elizabeth with being an empty figurehead and, and throwing the word fascism into boot somewhere in there as well. Uh, and more importantly, there was a phrase, no future, no future, no future, that kept being played at the end of the song. Now, I was at someone's house, and I didn't have a television set at the time. And they did, and it was the 11 o'clock news had come on, and they probably didn't want to put this on for the uh, 6 o'clock news in one of the three big stations. But the 11 o'clock news came on, and there was a very short piece about these really angry young uh, musicians in London and this stuff called punk rock and the Sex Pistols. And I heard it, and the first thing I heard was the sound of, like, Fingers on a chalkboard, scraping down. It had that kind of quality. Still does. And I heard this stuff and I said to myself, Huh, that's different. And what struck me as different about it was the anger. I had loved music since I was young. Not really young. I think I started about 11, 12 years old. And I just happened to hit that period in the late 60s at that stage where all these changes were happening, which is where my musical consciousness wakes up. So what happened to me as a child was by 1970, I could already see that the music had changed and become more commercialized. And so I was 15 years old, and I felt a sense of betrayal that the music, you know, suddenly we were listening to, like, the Archies singing Sugar Sugar and the Carpenters and the Jackson 5, which were just, didn't seem as meaningful and relevant as, I don't know, that stuff at the end of the 60s. And I never believed in the hippie ideology, uh, never taken drugs. I was much more interested in the ideas and also the roots. I, I, by that time, I'd gotten discovered blues music and classical music and all sorts of other things. So music became really important to me. Anyway, then I became a Christian through this Jesus People group. A long story. We won't go into it. But uh, they never said I had to get rid of my rock records, but I kind of did. 
I, I just decided these things weren't so valuable. Believe me, there were times later in my life where I just, every time I'd buy one of those records over again, I would just kick myself for having gotten rid of them. Same with my comic book collection, which I didn't get rid of again because anyone suggested it. I actually wanted to buy my mother a birthday present. And if I'd kept all those perfect mint condition, silver age DC comics, I probably wouldn't have any, uh, any uh, real financial worries right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's life. So, um, but when, as soon as I heard punk rock, I immediately said, ah, that's something I can relate to. Now, like I said, I was a Christian and, uh, I knew I wasn't going to like bring the record home and play it in this uh, somewhat communal situation I was living in. So what I did instead was I was working in a bookstore at the time and I had a little, uh, cassette recorder, uh, player. And I bought a copy of the cassette, and I would listen to it there. And I de devoured the first Sex Pistols album over and over, listening to it. And it started to give me thoughts about, what does this mean? One of the things that really struck me was that the rage in the music. Now, I did not feel this rage myself. But I, I heard that rage, and I said, ooh, that's, there's something different about that. Um, and you can still hear it. I mean, God Save the Queen is obvious. Anarchy in the UK is another one. If you really want to hear a song today that will simply, no matter what you believe today, you know, whether you think you're conservative or left wing or whatever, that will just simply make your back straighten out and go, oh, listen to the song Bodies. Take that song seriously. It is an absolute milestone in rage. Uh, I mean, basically it's about a girl named Pauline uh, who actually has an abortion. I think Johnny Rotten tells, John Lydon tells a story about how she actually had the baby with her after, the, or the fetus with her after an, an abortion or something crazy like this. I, I may be getting it wrong at, at the moment. I, I, I should do my homework, but my books aren't with me. So, uh, do you notice the plaid, though? I've gone plaid. I found this old piece of... It's really bad plaid. It's not nice cotton. It's like some sort of stretchy fabric, which is why it looks kind of behind me. But I like, I, I like the plaid, so I'm going with plaid for a while here. And I'm in color. I just decided to do that. I guess I, I look a little less pasty because I've been out in the sunshine. So, uh, anyway, the, it's about a girl who has an abortion. And, uh, oh, it's just, it's brutal. The first line is, she's saying to the baby, bodies, I'm not an animal. Which is like, what is that? It's like the mother saying, just because I had, because I, I had an abortion, I'm sorry, but I'm not an animal. Okay. The next one was, the next chorus is the father who is just, I can't even repeat the, the lines, they're, they're just so scabrous. And Johnny Rotten literally is going animalistic, and he's screaming to the bodies. You can almost see this pile of dead baby bodies, and he's screaming to the bodies, Bodies, I'm not an animal. And the last thing you hear in the song is the baby, like on this pile, you might say, screaming, Mommy. I'm not an animal. It's just, ugh, just brilliant. And, and it so captures the contradictions of modern life. Uh, you know, it's like everybody accusing each other of being animals, <laughs> of being just like evil and whatnot. And at the same time, everyone trapped in their, their problem. Sounds cool, buddy.
Sex Pistols. Here's what I've since discovered about the Sex Pistols and about that punk rock and what was unleashed during that moment. It's the first time in history that rage ever shows up in music like that. That just incohate bellow scream of rage. It does not show in some music. There's a slight prehistory. It's kind of like there are screams in garage rock in the 19... Uh, 60s, which I, I really love garage rock. There is the Iggy Pop moment, and he's the one who kind of starts to inject that rage. Iggy really doesn't like the hippies and has made a point of that many times. He just considers them completely phony, not living in the real world. Not that Iggy didn't do drugs, and, and not that Iggy wasn't totally sex, drugs, and rock and roll himself. So there you are. Uh, the contradictions continue. But then there's, uh, you know, you have other bands that, that are getting louder. But one, I think the real thing that Johnny Rotten and the Sex Pistols do is they add rage to the music. And the music shows it, and of course the voice shows it. And by the time you get to, say, Nick Cave, who's from Australia in a group called The Birthday Party, singing Fingers Down the Throat of Love, and it sounds like he's just vomiting after that. It's just... The 
that rage is really important. And that rage... Now, there's, there's a lot of different aspects to punk rock. One of them is the do-it-yourself, the DIY. I find that really crucial and a great creative thing to know. That you don't have to sit around trying to go through the official means of doing something, which in America at the time was to try to get a hit record through one of the big record companies. But today it might be, you know, trying to get uh, funding from, you know, uh, uh, some sort of uh, grant or, or even crowdfunding. That, that there's always another way to do it. You can always invent things. I mean, that's what the Texas Chainsaw Massacre showed me, too. You didn't need a great uh, set design in terms of classic... Uh, uh, backgrounds and costumes to, to make a real serious statement about art through like bones and feathers and fur and, and wood and such. That didn't cost much money. <laughs> it, it, you know, it's just, but what a, what an artistic statement. Likewise, the Sex Pistols, they just get out there and do it. Now, there's a whole history to the Sex Pistols and a whole history of punk rock, and I know all about it. It goes back, you know, we, uh, you know, you can go back and back and back on punk rock. Uh, obviously back to the 1960s with Iggy and what was happening in Detroit. Obviously, you can go back into garage rock. You can go back to the 1950s, uh, certain forms of, uh, of, uh, rhythm and blues and rockabilly. You can go back into the Pentecostal church to find that scream. You can go back and such, but you don't find the rage. Now, I say this with some authority. I have listened to music from pretty much, I mean, you pick a culture, I'm sure I've heard music from it. It's not ever about rage like that. That rage is a product of this modern world. That rage is a post-hippie rage. The hippies were false naivete. You know, purposeful naivete. Punk rock was just a punch to the fist in a black canvas saying, why have you left us this? And even your smug hippie optimism. And, and at that time... And this is really important. The hippies, the punks were really against hippies. Later, they would seem to be like they were always on the same page together. And this is what happened when the more uh, the, the punks became political. So in a group like The Clash, they start to adopt left-wing ideology. The Sex Pistols are not left-wing. They're just, you know, Johnny Rotten sings, I am an anarchist. He's not really an anarchist in any traditional sense. He's just super angry. And his voice can peel paint off the walls. And it's an amazing, it, it contains so much in it. It's, it's anger and rage, but it's also, it's, it's mockery and it's, it's sarcasm and, and there's humor and, and it's also just pure, plain black rage. And that mix met with a lot of people. And also the music was stripped down. It was no longer like a, you know, a 20 minute guitar solo followed by a 10 minute drum solo fo followed by the bass player it was no longer that sort of, uh, kind of hippie ideal. It was now just like short, three, four minute song, two minute song. Eventually with hardcore punk, it'd be like one minute song. It'd be a long song. It did not contain any hope. You know, find me punk songs or even new wave songs that are about love, real, really. Or love in any decent way. Even out, even someone who's only tangentially related, but still a part of the whole milieu, like Elvis Costello, his songs that are about human relationships and love are all dark. You know, watching the detectives. You know, it's just, it's just, uh, you know. There's a lot more I can say here. I don't want to make this series about music history, which I know way too much about. But I just want to say that what happened, what was unleashed in that moment was this permission to essentially just say F you to people. That was one of the worst parts of punk rock. Because it gave everyone the permission to say. And once everyone had that permission, eventually it trickled down to everybody. So we live in a world now where, I mean, just go online, you know, watch a YouTube video that someone disagrees with, you know, look at uh, movie reviews that someone disagrees with. People will just pull out the their absolute condemnation of others without thinking. Yeah, the hippies were wrong. 
But in their naivete, what they really wanted was to show love. They were naive about it. It was that Jack Kerouac, just like, you know, we're all, it's all good, man. Well, it isn't all good. And on the other hand, it's not all bad either. There are no punk rock songs about beautiful flowers. And there really should have been. But then again, there wouldn't have been punk rock in that sense. There's much more to say, but essentially, I think what we see by the end of the 1970s is several doors have been opened. One, we've got a mechanical culture that's opened up through disco. A mechanical culture, we all take part in it. Mechanic, eventually digital culture, electronic culture that we all take part in. And there are many aspects of that that are humanizing. There are also aspects of that that seek to fight the dehumanization. But in the end, you can't fight it with it. You become it, as in propaganda. When we fought propaganda, we became propagandists. And when you fight dehumanization with the tools of dehumanization, you become dehumanized and you spread further de dehumanization. Next, there is, and this is these are connected, that blockbuster culture is also, it's like creating worlds for people to inhabit that lessens their own imagination because now they have your world to live in and to fantasize about. And that message was not lost on the powers that be. And in the end, it's got some serious problems with it, which we will eventually discuss. Then there is the issue of a culture like rap music, hip hop, of reinventing culture from the beginning, of having no means. See, we've forgotten so many things, so people no longer know how to dance in so many places anymore. They don't know how to make music together. They know how to play music. They know how to you know, shout on microphones and sing on microphones. They know how to get amplifiers that you can hear uh, 30 blocks away in a city. But as far as human interaction, things as simple as eating together, it's complicated. It's all become complicated. But one thing about rap music is it does point to a door of possibilities of reinventing culture. But one of the things I would say is you can't reinvent. You have to go back and be re-inspired by the past. And finally, in punk rock, the rage is let out. That rage which we are still living in. And that's a very important thing. And it's a hopeless rage. It's a nihilistic rage. At the same time, uh, as I told a friend in the early, about 1980, I said, you know, in many ways I consider the Sex Pistols more Christian than most of the Christian music, pop music at the time. Why? Because that's all hollow. At least that rage was real. That is what this world has provoked in us. But the shiny pop music, whether it be Christian or all the synthetic music we have around us today, oh no, that is not human at all. That is something else. And the fact that they know how to market it to sell us, it, it's just like they know how to market a, a hamburger to us and sell it. They do a very good job of marketing these things and selling them to us. But that doesn't mean that they are better for us, nutritionally, either spiritually or physically. And um, But the good thing to learn from punk rock, I think, is DIY. Do it yourself. Don't stick around to argue. Don't ask for permission to do to work on art or to do anything. Don't try to get an NGO behind you. Don't try to get the powers that be behind you. Don't try to be liked. Just do things. Make <laughs>